morning. Happy Sunday. My name is Ashley. For those of you guys who don't know me, I lead worship here, and I would love it if you guys would join us in singing. Let's sing to God. seat. So, um, so grateful for you to be here today. I'm, I'm Nick Wong. I'm the youth pastor here at North Albany Community Church. Uh, so a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we are in October, which means Trunk or Treat is right around the corner. Uh, it is a great event we do every single year, uh, an opportunity to just uh, community outreach, bring the community over and, and uh, give them a safe place to, to trick or treat. Um, I think we had 
700 that came through last? It was a lot. It was a lot. We had a lot of candy left over, which was good, but, you know, we were rationing a little bit. So we have a couple opportunities on how you can serve. One, if you'd like to set up a trunk and give out candy, give out prizes, um, you can decorate it up. It's a lot of fun. I had a hockey-themed one last year, a little game the kids can play. Um, we're looking for people to do that. We're looking for greeters. We're looking for parking attendants. We're looking for people willing to pray for people who might want it. Um, and we're looking for candy donations. So if any of those things you'd like to participate in, uh, if you can go onto um, our website, there's a, there's a link you can click to, to register or just contact the church or write it on your communication card you'd like to serve in some capacity. Uh, but that is on October 31st, and it's from 4 to 7 p.m., Trunk or Treat. Um, and then lastly, we have some signups out there uh, for connect groups. Um, we still have some space in some of those. They meet throughout the week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, there, I, there might be some other ones opening up throughout the week. But, um, you know, if you see the sign-up sheets out there and you want to be part of a connect group to really get together in a smaller group, build relationships, and dig deeper into uh, Sunday's messages, uh, it's a great opportunity to do so. So we ask that you sign up for that. Let's continue on with some, wor so with some worship, shall we? All right, please join everyone else in standing. I'm not standing right now. <laughs> As we go back into this uh, worship song. This is a new one, so feel free to just worship along and listen to the lyrics if you don't really know it.
Go ahead and grab a seat. At this time, I ask if you would grab the communication cards that are in the seat backs or on the seats in front of you. And at this time, uh, if, if you're new here and on the front part, if you can just write down your name, phone number, um, just an opportunity for us to get to know you. On the back side, uh, we do this every week, an opportunity to, to lift up our prayer requests to God. And uh, we, have, we have a team of people that meet twice a week to, to pray for these. We have a team of people who meet, uh, get emails and pray for them, just whether they're eating breakfast or, or just any time they, they think of it, they're driving to work, they'll be lifting these up in prayer. So what I would encourage you to do at this time is write down um, a prayer request that you have on your heart. Um, we're going to take offering in a few minutes, and you'll have an opportunity to drop it in there. But write down a prayer request or a praise if God's doing something truly amazing in your life and you want to just glorify him for it. I encourage you to write that. So let's, uh, let's fill those out. Take a moment to do so. I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward for offering. And as they do so, uh, I'd like to invite Dan up here. He's going to lead us in prayer this morning. Um, we, we like to have somebody come up and uh, just just pray for us. Pray for our church. Pray for the city. Pray for our congregation. Um, pray for the service. So, uh, Dan, why don't you go ahead and lead us? Good morning. My name is Dan. Good morning. Praise the Lord our God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who created each of us individually. I really enjoy math and science, and isn't it cool that we're going to two services today? Multiplication, the doubling of the number of our services. Two is greater than one. It's a mathematical fact. Uh, and isn't it amazing, too, that when God created us, he gave us two ears and one mouth. I remember when Tom was preaching about the greatest commandment earlier this summer. And he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, pointing to our vertical relationship with our Creator, our horizontal relationship with the second commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves bouncing back to the greatest commandment with internal sanctification of our heart, changing our heart from following our own ways to his ways. I would like to read the verse before that in the Old Testament and a couple of verses after that as Jesus referred to them. And at that time, Israel was getting ready to pass, pass into the promised land. It was a picture of us, a foreshadowing of us uh, entering the kingdom of God. In Deuteronomy 6.3, he said, Hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord your God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. And then, after the greatest commandment, it comes to the mind part. And he said, these words I command you to today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when, we, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. I believe these scriptures are a foreshadow pointing to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We thank you, our Father 
for sending your son, Jesus the Christ, to go before us, loving us so much in his heart that he willingly and obediently went to the cross to take our punishment for us, atoning for our sins. And then rising from the dead on that resurrection Sunday, thank you for loving us, our Father who is in heaven. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power forever. God, please pour out your Holy Spirit on the people of this church to do your will, to follow you, because you are the way, the truth, and the life. Be with those who are sick. You are our healer, God our healer. All things are possible through through you. Be with those who mourn, for they will be comforted in you. Give wisdom to our leadership within the church to follow you. Help us to love each other as you loved us. Give, give wisdom to our government to do what is right rather than what is wrong. Help us to turn from our ways and to follow your ways. Be with Tom as he shares your words. Help us abide in you and bear fruit for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, all. Good to uh, be back with you. I was gone last week, as you know, and, and uh, had a wonderful time at a uh, conference, uh, the Gospel Coalition Conference that was held in Indianapolis. And I don't know if you've ever been to Indianapolis, but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> Not a lot there. Sorry if I offend you if you're from Indianapolis, but, you know, usually you go to a conference and you think, well, I'll, I'll hit this session and that session and then Maybe I'll go see this interesting thing or that interesting thing. And no, nope, not in Indianapolis. Uh, and that's about it. So, <laughs> so unless you like flat land, um, we think it's flat here in the valley, but whew, boy, I tell you, they have a tower in the center of town, it's, it's called the War Memorial. It's to mem memorialize all the soldiers from the state of Indiana. And it's tall. It's way up there. It's, it's probably, I don't know, 10 stories tall. If you're in that tower, you can see the borders of Indiana. I mean, that's how flat the state is. Well, that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, what we do want to talk about is we, we kind of want to round out our... Uh, our time in the area of discipleship. And I hit it pretty hard the first couple of weeks uh, concerning our giving habits as a disciple. And Dave, I think, talked about service last week. Uh, I'm going to have a couple of guys hand something out. Did you, do you have an outline for today's sermon? It, okay, keep that uh, ready, at the ready. We're going to use that. 
but these guys are going to hand out this card. Now, I mentioned this the first couple of weeks. It's really nothing more than a commitment card on your part to be a better disciple. And who doesn't need that? And we're going to talk about that a little bit today, rounding out some of the things that disciples are and disciples do. Uh, you'll notice when you get this card, it has a, a perforation in the center. So the top half is for you to keep as a bookmark, to remind yourself that you want to be a better disciple. The bottom half is more of a prayer card, almost like the one that you filled out. What we'd like to have is, is your name on the top, nothing else, just your name. And then there are three things that are listed on this card. It says, I will serve, I will give, I will, be a, I will grow as a discipler. Um, there are some of those, one, one or two of those areas that might apply to you. So what we'd like you to do is at the bottom half, tear it off, sign your name so we can pray for you and encourage you and drop it in one of our boxes that will be out in the uh, hallway there, one of those slotted boxes. Now, for right now, all you have to do is set it next to you. You don't have to fill it out this very minute, but uh, sometime during the service, go ahead and do that. Maybe when I'm going long, you can just do that and, you know, ignore me. And then drop that part. Keep the book. Keep the bookmark in your Bible as a good bookmark, but keep the uh, bottom part to drop into a box out there later. Maybe I'll make mention of this again as we, as we close today. Also, we're going to two services today, so it's natural. People are going to, right about now, it's 9.30, we're probably going to see three or four families come in who didn't know. That's okay. It takes about two weeks for us to figure out numbers in terms of the services. This is much much more even, I think, than uh, the last time we did two services. Now, I don't want to jinx it, but the last time we did two services, we went about three weeks, maybe four, and COVID hit, and we had to close down, just completely close down. You remember the first weeks where everybody was in their house? Well, that happened to us. So now we're, we're in uh, part two of two services. We're going to see how this goes. But this is a much, much more even group, and I want to commend you for that, because last time... Uh, it, th there were some who didn't want to go to the second service, I think it was. So we had the first service, and it was packed in here, and there were uh, hardly anybody at the second service. So consider, you know, you take a couple weeks and think about it. Do I want to be at church at 9, or do I want to be at church at 10.30? You can always come early for that second service and fellowship around a little bit uh, in, the, uh, in the lobby. But I want to encourage you to think about it, take a week, and it's always about two or three weeks before people get the hang of the time changes and the service changes. The big benefit of meeting like this is you'll notice there's no West Wing, right? We have a plentiful space for people to come and worship. So that's a good thing for people that like to be sort of spread out. But it's also a good opportunity for you to uh, invite friends. And sure, if we fill this service, we'll open up the West Wing. But the idea is we want to make space for people. We're not hung up on numbers, but we want to make space for people. Uh, another thing that it helps us out with is, if, ha if you haven't been told already, it gives us an opportunity to help uh, each of us serve in the church and worship in the church. Uh, there are folks who do Sunday school and they do the behind-the-scenes stuff, and they don't get to worship. Well, with two services now, they get to worship, and we can rotate in and out. And, and I would hope that you'd want to be a part of that. But uh, today what we're doing is we're talking about discipleship, and I want to start off by telling a story. This is a story of a guy who was hired to take 500 penguins to a zoo, and he had a truckload of penguins, uh, you know, frozen truck, refrigerated truck, and he's got all these penguins, and he's headed off the zoo, but his truck breaks down. So what's a guy supposed to do? He sees another trucker come by, and he stops him, and he says, look, We'll hook my trailer up to yours. If you will take them to the zoo, I will pay you uh, $500 if you'll take them to the zoo. And so the, they do all that trading around and they go do their thing. Now the first trucker, he goes to get his truck fixed and while he's in town, he sees the second trucker. But he's walking across a, a crosswalk and he's being followed by 500 penguins walking behind him. And he runs over to him and says, hey, I told you to take them to the zoo. And he said, I did, but we had some money left over, so now we're going to go to a movie. <laughs> That's a dad joke, but it makes a point. 
It makes a great point. The point is this. Obviously, he misunderstood the assignment, right? He didn't quite know what he was supposed to be doing. And um, that's what we're going to talk about today. Primarily, we're going to focus on uh, discipleship and what it is and what it means to the life of the church and how you can be a part of it. So all of that is, is in this message this morning. And I want you to know, if you look at your outline, there's really not a one, two, three sort of outline. These are more of uh, gathered thoughts. And so as we go through them together, you can sure fill out your outline, but I don't want you to miss any of the point. And um, we're going to talk about the command that, that Jesus gives us and how important that is to us as a church. So you don't need to stand, but let me read to you uh, Matthew 28, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. It's a very familiar passage to you, but it is the command that we're given. And I appreciated Dan's prayer this morning as we delve into this. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Those were Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven. And we want to make sure that we understand exactly what he meant by those. And so what we're going to talk about is that very thing. We're going to talk about this commandment that he gives us. In other words, what's the mission and the commission for disciples of Jesus? If you love Jesus, what is your job? If you love Jesus, what is it you're supposed to do? I think a lot of times the world looks at people in the church and they see the church but they don't really see what the church does or what the church is about. And so they can go, walk away with a thought that really we're just a bunch of people who have some wonderful thoughts and ideas about the afterlife, but we really don't do anything about it. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is that mission? What does it mean to be a believer? The outside world looking and even some of us on the inside looking in, we sometimes don't know. We just don't know. Imagine a basketball game. Imagine that you had tickets to the OSU basketball team's games during the season, maybe season tickets. And you take your season tickets and you go down there and you're so anxious and you give your ticket to the person at the door. It's probably on your phone these days, right? You give your ticket to the person and they let you in and you find your seat and you sit and you get ready to watch. And only you notice something this time. It's, it's a little bit different. And you look down at the court and what? what's different about the court today? It just looks kind of funny. And you see the players all gather on the court and they're about to throw the ball up and start the game and you realize there's no baskets. There's just no baskets. And so one team runs down the court with the ball. The other team steals the ball. And they run down the other end of the court with the ball. The other team steals the ball again and runs down the... And nobody's scoring. What's the point? If there's no scoring... What's the point? And that's sort of how we do Christianity today, unfortunately. I, I think mo in most of our churches, uh, this conference I was at, uh, it was evident as some of the classes that they were offering and some of the, the, the uh, big sessions that we had and uh, some of the things that people were asking about. It's obvious that churches are really, really hurting today. And I think what it really comes down to is kind of getting back to the basics. What is the church supposed to do? What is our goal? How do we score? Uh, or are we just running around? A lot of spiritual activity, but not a lot of com completing our goals. Not a lot of doing what the Lord has asked us to do. What is it he wants from me? What is it I'm supposed to be about as a believer? Well, um, do, do we as a church you know, know our goals? Do we ha are they plainly stated? Do we, not just the local church, but the church at large? Do we know what we're supposed to be accomplishing? If we don't know what the command and the mission is, then we just end up running around. And I don't think that impresses anybody in the world. I don't think that gives anybody uh, an inkling of, oh, that's something I'd like to be a part of, because they don't know how that benefits them. Uh, raise your hand if you're really busy these days. Are you busy? Of course you're busy. If you didn't raise your hand, it's because you're too busy. You're probably on your phone or talking, you know, or doing something. We're all busy. And so when people look at the church, I don't think they want to see a bunch of more busy work. I think they want to see something with purpose that answers questions, deep questions in their life. And you know what's amazing is people will do things, they'll give 
things and they'll pay for things if they find there's value in it. I was reading an article just this morning, reading an article about uh, a woman in Los Angeles, and I don't remember her name, but she pretends to channel Jesus. And so about every three months, she holds a seminar or a session or whatever you want to call it where there's a lot of hoopla and then she comes out on the stage and she sits in a sort of a you know, big, nice, comfortable chair and she begins to channel Jesus. The idea that if you go, you're going to hear what Jesus wants from you. And she's, this is not, she's not, I mean, she's a weirdo. Don't get me wrong. But she's not unknown. Uh, there are a lot of people in Los Angeles that you would know their names who attend her meetings. Jennifer Aniston, Uma Thurman, you know, other uh, entertainment entities and athletic entities. And, and they go. And you know what? They don't take an offering. They pay $1,111. I don't know what the significance of that is, but you have to pay to be there. To hear her, I guess, channel Jesus. Well, to me, it's a fraud, but it gives us an indication that people will pay big bucks just to be a part of something they think might answer some of life's deepest questions. Uh, to hear from God, to hear from Jesus himself. People want answers, and we have the answer. But we sometimes don't look like we have the answer. Jesus showed us exactly how to fulfill people's lives, to share with them what the answers are, and it's all in the last statement that he made. Go and baptize people and make disciples, right? Teaching them all the things that you've observed. So our job is to follow this, this great commission, go therefore and make disciples. That is uh, a two-part statement, really. The first deals with evangelism. Everybody loves evangelism, but nobody likes to do it. It's the, job of, it's the job of a disciple to do evangelism. Now, how did it happen in Jesus' day? Because there's a good, uh, a good picture of what discipleship involving evangelism should look like in Jesus' day. Jesus would go to people, and he would tell his story. And then those people, we call them the apostles, they would sit and listen to Jesus, and then they would go out, and they would find people, and they would share Jesus' story. And it was a disciple making a disciple making a disciple. That was how evangelism happened in Jesus' day. Pretty significant. But we tend to rely on others to do that, right? I love evangelism, but I'll leave that to the pastor or the evangelist speaker. Or, you know, I'll, I'll go to the, the Christian concert and I'll participate in worship. I might even work in my church's Sunday school classes or something, but I really don't want to be somebody who, who talks about Jesus to others in my workplace or my home or out in the street or my club that I belong to. Because if I do, I'm fearful that uh, I'll be classified as, um, you know, I, I'm a weirdo, I'm a religious freak or I might who knows I might lose my job if I speak out too much or I might lose a friendship and yet evangelism is what we're called to do for a disciple um, in, in Jesus words we're going to go out and we're going to see that others hear hear the uh, gospel and it says here we're going to baptize them in the name and it isn't the baptism that that saves them the idea in this is that all disciples that's sort of a marker of all disciples. If you, I share with you the story and you say, yes, I want to come to Jesus. I want to know what that's like. I want to have a, 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 a eternity with him. And I want salvation in my life every day. I want to work that out. When you do that, you, you get Jesus and you get all of him. You get the Holy Spirit. You get all of him. But when you get is. And you know, baptism isn't unique to the Christian church, even in Jesus' day. There were cults that baptized. There were other religions out there that were pseudo-Jewish that would baptize. And it was always for the same thing. It was a sign. It was a sign of your commitment. Later in the early church, we know that baptism meant almost certain death. 
if you were a believer and you got baptized in a public way, it could be a very difficult thing. Because then the were pretty much signing a death warrant or something like it. I had a friend years ago who, and it's, it, it's just as pertinent today as it was then, a friend years ago who came to Christ and he, and he loves Jesus to this day, but he came from a background, a Catholic background, in which his family was not, uh, they, it wasn't pleasant for them that he gave his life to Jesus because that wasn't the way it worked in their church. You were born, you were baptized as an infant, and therefore you were saved. And he understood that he needed to really love Jesus to be saved, and he confessed that before the church, and he got baptized, and none of his family came to see him be baptized. And many of them, you know, the Christmas cards stopped. I mean, this is a grown man. Uh, his family didn't ask him to come over for meals anymore. It became an issue for him. And you know, a lot of people would give up there, but he, he struggled through that. He understood his loyalty belonged to Jesus. So for us as disciples, it's our job to go out, share the gospel with people, and make sure that it sticks, that there's a testimony there that a believer would want to say, yes, I, I love Jesus, I'll be baptized. And the idea here is that evangelism is, is taking place. And then we see that in Jesus' words, go therefore and make disciples. Now that we've got a disciple, he's going to go and make disciples, or she's going to go and make disciples. So the idea of disciple of Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, is embedded in Jesus' words that it would be continuous. That Jesus did it, now his apostles are doing it, and the apostles are sharing with others, and those others are doing it. They're going to their family, they're going to their friends. And of course we see in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, where the church was just exploding. Why was that? It, it was some great preaching going on, but the reality is everybody was sharing with everybody that Jesus was Lord. And we are seeing people come by the hundreds and thousands. Eventually, the gospel spreads across the Mediterranean. Why? Because some uh, preacher preached a great thing. Well, you could look at Peter and say, yeah, Peter preached a great sermon at Pentecost, but it was because others told others. And that's the evangelism part of of being a disciple, that, that idea that it's embedded and it's a part of who we are. Certainly, disciples will be involved in that disciple-making process. So are you? That's the question of the day. Are you involved in that process? Then we have more than, than just, hey, go do it. We have sort of a, a method, or I would say characteristics, or write this word down, I would call it the pentaristics of discipleship. It's five things. You know, pentagram has five sides. Pentaristic char uh, characteristics of, of uh, disciples. First is, when you become a disciple, you have a new identity. Everything in the past is let go. You are, you're coming to Christ. You're saying, hey, this is who I want to be. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be different because I'm going to be uh, new in Christ Jesus. Once you've realized that newness, the second thing is you're going to become a student of the Word. Now, in Jesus' day, that was pretty easy because that meant listening. And we all like to sit and listen. I can tell every Sunday morning I see people sitting and listening. That's all right. But we also have God's Word. We have it in written form. And so we ought to make time to go in and look at God's Word. That's really significant. You know, the idea that I, I am... Uh, I have a new identity is not too hard to grasp, but okay, Tom, what do I do now that I'm a believer? John 8, 31 uh, says, uh, it says, you know, if you follow my commands, then you are my disciple. If you follow my words, then you're my disciple. Well, how do we do that unless we've got a good Bible and we're involved in it, right? Reading it. There's so many ways we can be involved in Bible study. These days you can have a Bible, and you can read it. How many of you have a, like a real Bible in your hands today? Like a, I say a real Bible because if it's not pages, it's not real, Kathy. If it's not a book. The real ones at home. Oh, oh, the real ones at home. Okay, that, I'll, I'll let that slide. Um, just so happens, I bought a new Bible. Can't do a thing with it. The pages are all stuck. I'm just breaking it in. Spend time in your, in your Bible. 
I've got one that just is so dog-eared and beaten up and duct taped, and it's one I've had for years. It's one, my favorite one to study out of. I love it. But you know, you don't want that to show up on Sunday morning, so I get the new shiny one. And uh, it, it, it's hard sometimes to get through the pages, but, but I, want to, I want to be in it. A disciple says, well, tell me more about this Jesus. How do I learn more about this Jesus? How do I know what Jesus wants? And we want to be, if we're a good disciple, we want to dive into the word to know what Jesus wants. So a student of the word. Second, or thirdly, would be the area of love. Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, love one another, that others may know you're my disciple, right? Jesus put a high, the watermark was really high on that boat, right? Because Jesus wanted everybody to know his ministry was about loving people. He loved people and he wanted his disciples to love people. He especially wanted them to love each other. I find that passage really interesting. Love one another, that others may know you. That, that's speaking to us as a church, right? A new disciple, a new person in Christ is going to want to develop a love for other believers. Now, does that mean I'm going to agree with them all the time? No. No, we might not agree on political parties. We might not agree on uh, you know, football teams. We might not agree on the stuff of life. I, you invest this way, I invest that way. You, know, you want to retire at 60, I want to retire at 70. It doesn't, those issues are tertiary, right? Those are not very important. But what is important is that I love you anyway and that you love me anyway. And the world sees that. And Jesus says, they'll know you're my disciples if you love one another. How do we exemplify that love? Sometimes it's by works. Sometimes it's by gifting, right? Sometimes we help those in need. Sometimes we, we work for those in need and we, uh, we move them or we rake the leaves in their yard or whatever it might be. We're going to show our love for them. Love one another. In the early church, they made a big deal of that. They would cook meals and they would all eat together. And the book of Acts tells us that all the disciples would come together and load up all their stuff and divvy it out for those that had need. How important is that for us? Thirdly, or fourthly, is the idea of fruit bearing. Disciples have always been fruit bearing from the day that Jesus gave this commandment on. And so for us, this is the toughest one again because it gets to that evangelism thing. Are we, are we good at fruit bearing? God gets glorified, and it's evidence of your discipleship. If you look at John 15, 80, it tells us, tells us that God gets the glory, and it's evident that you are my disciples if fruit is being born from your relationship to Christ. If you, you know, work in a particular place or you, you gather with certain clubs or groups, do those people know that you're a believer? How do they know that you're a believer? Do you share with them? Do you ask your friends and your coworkers, your family, do you ask penetrating questions? Do you talk about important things? Do you try to dive deep into their life? You know, people, as I said earlier, are looking for that answer. We have the answer. Uh, don't be afraid to share your testimony with you about Jesus. And then lastly, the works of a disciple are so, so important. John 14, 11 speaks to that. You know, people will believe because of the works that you do. Do great works. Works are not the key to our salvation, but they, they certainly are a reflection of our salvation, aren't they? Do great works. What does that mean? What is a work? Well, a work is anything that isn't grace, right? God gives me salvation by grace. As a response, I'm going to do great works. That means I'm going to work in ministry. It means I'm going to give of my finances. It means I'm going to be involved in somebody else's life, encouraging them. That's a work. Lots of great works. Some people build buildings. Some people pave roads in the name of Jesus. And you know what? Those are great works. There's nothing, nothing wrong with those works at all. They are a part of the life of a disciple. Now, there are lots of um, things that come up in the life of disciples that are not necessarily, uh, not necessarily, I want to say, salvation bringing. They, they don't necessarily communicate. And this is where life gets tough. This is where we have to decide and what we're going to do and why we do th these things. 
For instance, I wrote these down. Things that we have uh, not been commanded to do or commissioned to do, but are good things. We have not been commanded to alleviate hunger and poverty or create recreation programs. We have not been commanded to take on uh, the TV and movie industry or to tackle illiteracy. We have not been commanded to build low-income housing or to promote political campaigns. We have not been uh, commanded to create hospitals or to provide psychological counseling for the homeless. We've not been commanded to provide disaster relief or to alleviate drug and alcohol abuse. We have not been commanded to provide, uh, to provide daycare centers or, or even Christian schools. You can kind of see what I'm getting at here. These are great things, aren't they? Every single one of them is a good thing. It's a good thing, but it's not the main thing. It's not the thing we've been commanded to do. It's not the thing that we were told by Jesus to do. They should never take over the the church's main message, which is go find people and turn them into disciples. That's our job. So disciples of Jesus must keep first things first. Okay, so that's the, that's the evangelism side. Um, I want to get into why we don't do it. A lot of it is, is difficult, um, but prayer can overcome those difficulties. I want to take you now into the second part of that, which is the discipling part. It's where churches really struggle the most. Um, how do we make a new Christian a, a full-blown, growing uh, and sometimes a not-so-new Christian, but a full-grown, blown, uh, blown uh, person who's growing in Christ. Um, we need to fulfill that Great Commission. It falls apart if we don't do it. Whose job is it if the church won't do it? If the church doesn't make disciples from generation to generation to generation, what's going to happen? If the church doesn't... make disciples. So as a church, we should be involved in that. We could probably all agree on that, right? It seems simple enough. If, if the church needs disciples, we need to make disciples. Um, interesting, Paul writes to Timothy. By the way, Timothy was Paul's disciple or, or learner under Paul. And uh, he says, you therefore, my son, be strong and in the grace that is in, in, the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others as well. Paul telling Timothy, this is how it works. I'm going to share with you, and you're going to share with others. Paul was just saying, hey, what I taught you is, is the way that Jesus wants us to do it. Listen to what, in our modern time, listen to what Billy Graham has to say about that. Billy Graham, one of the, uh, one of the first verses, this is his quote, one of the first verses of Scripture that Dawson Trotman, founder of the Navigators, encouraged me to memorize was 2 Timothy 2.2. This is like a mathematical formula for spreading the gospel and enlarging the church. Paul taught Timothy. Timothy shared what he knew with faithful men. These faithful men would then teach others also. And so the process goes on and on. If every believer followed this pattern, the church could reach the entire world in one generation. Then he goes on to say this, what I think is very telling. Mass crusades, in which I believe, and to which I have committed my life, will never finish the Great Commission, but one-to-one -one ministry will. Isn't that amazing? I mean, Billy Graham didn't see himself as the one that was going to bring everybody to Christ, even though hundreds of thousands of people came to Christ through Billy Graham. But because of multiplication, one-to-one -one relationships is the way that the world is going to hear about Jesus. Dr. Herschel Hobbes wrote this. He said, The work of evangelism is never complete until the one evangelized becomes the one evangelizing. For many, I think it's uh, easy to drop into uh, working with children or drop into working with youth because we think that's easy. Uh, maybe that won't be as difficult as trying to uh, evangelize a peer or disciple a peer. And to some degree, you're probably right. But I would say it's the most important work that can be done because most people come to Christ before they're 18 years old. And so being there to help disciple them or being there to help evangelize those young people is, is a primary thing to be involved in in terms of church growth. It's so significant. 
So the goal is not to have converts to Christianity. Rather, the goal is to make disciples. Does that make sense? We don't want to just go out and have people raise their hand at a rally or something like that. We want to, we want to see people actually growing in their relationship with Jesus. And we want that growth to include their own evangelism and their own discipleship of others. That's what Jesus commanded. That's what we ought to be about. Dwight Moody said this, It's better to train ten people than to try to do the work of ten people. But it is harder. It's harder. On that note, what I want to tell you is we've had some talks about discipleship, in the coming year here in our church. And we're going to make a, a huge effort to make sure everybody is being discipled. What do I mean by that? Well, simply, we're going to develop a strategy. It, it, it's not an eternal thing. It's just something that we think will help us now to help you become a better and a growing disciple. We're going to give you opportunities to meet and to be with others and to pray with others to be encouraged, to have your own evangelism movement going on where you can share with others. We're going to do this in a church-structured way just to give it some structure, just to give it some framework. And that will probably take place in January or February. And we're looking at plans now and what that, what that will look like. And we've done things in the past that have helped, and I think this will be a big help as well. And so as we think about discipleship, the church and the church leaders have looked at ways in which we can develop leaders in the church, and develop disciples in the church, and we're going to put some of those things into practice. So here's the deal. Dr. Howard Hendricks said, every disciple needs three types of relationships in his life. He needs a Paul who can mentor him uh, and challenge him. He needs a Barnabas who can come alongside him and encourage him. And he needs a Timothy, someone that he can pour his life into. We each need a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. I want you on your outline, I think that's in there, I want you on your outline at the very bottom to write in the names. You don't have to show it to anybody, but write the names of the people in your life that fill those slots. Who's your challenger? Who's your Paul? Who's the person that comes along and encourages you? Who's your Barnabas? Who is the learner in your life? Who is it that you're pouring yourself into? I want you to fill those out. I also want you to grab that card that we now have. And this is where it gets the, the rubber meets the road. What does it mean to you to be a disciple, and how significant do you want that to play a role in your life? Um, go ahead and tear that off, and this is what I want you to do. They're supposed to be boxes, but because they were sort of a light gray, they didn't print. So where it says, I will serve, and it says, I will give, and it says, I will grow, what I would like you to do is the area that you really need to um, improve in it might be all three, it might be just one, but go ahead and circle it. Go ahead and just circle it. What area do you need to improve in? What is it that you could be better at as a disciple? Go ahead and circle those, and then what I'd like you to do is just put your name at the top. We, all we're going to use your name for is, is to pray for you. That's all it is. We're just going to use to pray. We're not going to contact you. We're not going to sell your information to Google. We just want to pray for you. So circle the, the area that you find you need the most help so we can pray for you. And then keep the other half because that's going to remind you to work on those areas, to work on becoming a better disciple and what a disciple means. In the next six months or so, we'll be praying for you off and on and you need to be working at it off and on and the church will provide some of the structure for you. Let me uh, pray for us. This, again, I realize isn't a traditional outline of sorts. The thing I don't want you to miss is that you love Jesus. That makes you a disciple. And I hope you know what disciples do. They make other disciples. Let's uh, close in a word of prayer. Lord, as we go from this place, as we leave uh, this sanctuary, would you convince us of the need to uh, love others and to be involved in discipleship with them and for them. Lord, could we be better evangelists? Could we be better teachers and, and sharers of the gospel? Lord, I would pray that we could be. Lord, as we uh, sing, as we pray, may we be convicted that discipleship is what you want from us. It's where we need to be. It's how we will grow. It's how our church will grow in maturity 
and in number. And Father, we just ask that you'd be with us as we work through that in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and stand. We're going to sing one last song before we dismiss.
We're going to pray before we go, and I want you to, to think seriously about what a disciple is. This week, as you go your way, what am I supposed to be as a disciple? How is Jesus going to help me in that process? What does it mean? And how can I be better? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. May we be those who follow your commands. May we be those who love one another. May we put all of our efforts into those five areas of discipleship. That we might know more of what it is to be like you. Father, we pray that we would not be one of those churches where the growth of the church or the idea of discipleship just ends. But no, Lord, we want to see our friends, our family, our neighbors, our club members, or wherever, whoever we run into, Lord, we want them to know you. We want them in heaven. We want them to be disciples as well. Help us, Lord, to be disciple makers as we go. Lord, may we trust you to keep us safe and in all ways faithful. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Say hi to somebody before you take off this morning.